talk about the euthanasia and moral stress. The recent study that was published in England, and another one in Australia, confirms that there's been a lot of new reviews based on anecdotal evidence, namely that suicide among veterinarians is higher than any other profession. In the 1980s, I identified a problem that is pervasive among the main society of animal shelter workers, laboratory animal personnel. Veterinarians, I call it moral stress. Uh, they call it now compassion fatigue, which is a more sissy term. Moral stress is a unique and insidious form of stress that cannot be alleviated by normal approaches to stress management. It arises among the people we identified above, whose life will contain them at promoting the well being of animals. There's little doubt that people who volunteer for work in animal shelters are there out of concern for animals, which are not much good for the money. Yet in far too many cases, their major activity turns out to be killing them once they go to death. Many research technicians do go into field animal research in order to help the animals if their day to day work ends up being killing of animals or being complicit in creating pain, distress, disease, and other noxious states demanded by the research. Equally certain is the fact that the vast majority of veterinarians enter the field in order to treat disease, alleviate pain and suffering, and provide high quality lives for the animals to whom they minister. And historically, veterinarians, like shelter workers, have been called upon to kill unwanted animals for a following reasons, what has been called convenience and danger. The state of affairs creates moral stress in the groups identified as well. This kind of stress is a, grows out of the radical conflict between one's reasons for entering the field and what one in fact ends up doing. Furthermore, normal avenues for alleviating stress are not available in this area. Whereas if one is stressed by normal stressors, standard stress management of vehicles are quite helpful. For example, relaxation techniques or talking it out with tears and family. These modalities are not available for moral stress. One woman who lived in shelter told me, I tried to explain to my husband at dinner that I had killed the nicest dog earlier in the day. He responded by clapping his hands over his ears and telling me he didn't want to hear about it. The eventual effect of such long-term um, unalleviated stress is likely to be deterioration of physical and mental health and well-being substance abuse, of course, and even, as I encountered on a number of occasions, suicide. Uh, a very dark incident that I had. A woman who came up to me in the 80s, in the 80s, symposium, and she said, you're doing it, you know, being uh, the attractive guy I am, and I'm assuming that she was hitting on me. So I said, well, I'm going to see my old woman. Why? She said, I need to talk to her. I said, we got now. I sat down and chatted with her, and she started to cry. She was a major in the Air Force, a veterinarian, and had become a veterinarian to leave me in that you know. And she, she was told that if she becomes an officer, she has to do a thing about my If she um, if she was board certified and published, and she did all that, she was probably 33, 34 years old. And so we chatted for a while, and I kept in touch with her by the phone. And uh, six months later, I couldn't get her. And I remember going to an ALS meeting and asking her some of her friends. She shot herself. It's uh, not that uncommon. How many of you work in animal shelters? What's the effect of life of a worker in that job? Uh, very well, right? Divorce, alcohol, and And I got in trouble with the uh, shelter managers because I asked these people, what's the most stressful thing? And they said, well, the most stressful thing is uh, people come in and say, one woman came in and said, I've got a 16-year-old Labrador and he's blind and he's too much of a pain in the ass to care for it. So I want you to place it uh, in a home in the lake, uh, good home, 16-year-old dog. And I said, well, what did you tell them? What they instructed me to tell them. Um, 
and I'll do my best. I said, actually, it'd be much better for you to go drop dead, and, uh, and nobody's going to take the dog, and it's going to be euthanized on Friday. Well, the managers found out that's what I was telling the workers, and that would be a bit much less kind of career. Um, I did not realize the full impact of moral stress on companion animal practitioners until the early 80s. When I was part of a group, some of you maybe, maybe were there, um, held a symposium on client grief, sponsored by the Animal Medical Center at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Did you come up that? At the Medical School in New York. Um, during the first question period, a veterinarian stood up and commented, look, if I did not know how to deal with client grief, I would not have been able to stay in business. What I really need to know, he said, is how I deal with my grief when I'm constantly confronted with demands to kill healthy animals, some of them I was up all night to save it because they got in my car and this and that. So it really it, it changed the whole direction of this probably because there were very few vets that didn't know how to deal with fighting. Convenience euthanasia was for a long time perhaps the major ethical issue confronting uh, companion animal practitioners. Imagine the psychological impact of constant demands to kill healthy animals for following reasons. By the way, these are all real examples that I got from the people who had decided that the dog is too old to run with me anymore. We have them decorated and the dog no longer matches the color scheme. That's probably my favorite. Um, it's cheaper to get another dog uh, when I return from vacation and pay for the kennel fee. The economic argument. Um, and no, I guess my absolute favorite was this one. I finished with analysis, and I'm not a poodle person anymore. I'm now a Doberman person. Um, most perniciously, I do not want to spend the money on the procedure you recommend uh, to treat the animal or cheat the dog. Small wonder then that veterinarian's mental well-being and job satisfaction can be eroded. In Western democracies, after all, who we are our personal identities are inextricably bound up with what we do with our jobs. If somebody asks you, if I think about it, what are you, you may answer your profession. Right? The vast majority of veterinarians see their raison d'etre as being improving the health and well-being and happiness of animals in their societal roles. Uh, by the way, large animal guys just as much as small animal guys is that the sheer health that we demonstrated this morning. When companion animal veterinarians face regular requests for convenience euthanasia, uh, it is no wonder that they face more stress and loss of joy in their work. Somewhat compensatory for the moral stress attendant upon a steady stream of requests for euthanasia is what has been called alternatively the gift of euthanasia. Whereas human physicians are not empowered to help harm the suffering patients on their pain by providing access to and certain select jurisdictions, veterinarians are fortunately blessed to be able to end suffering by providing a peaceful and technical step. As the vast international movement in favor of assisted human suicide protests, laws of Belgium, the Netherlands, Oregon, the work of Dr. Samorki, and regular pleas in the medical journals to death with dignity, it has become clear that many, if not most, human patients fear pain and the suffering and degradation that extreme pain inflicts on patients and families far more than we do like that. I think that makes sense. Certainly as I get older, I can empathize with that. It was the recognition of this point that led to the organization of the unique conference in 1980 in New York, sponsored jointly by the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and the Animal Medical Center for Pregnancy. Animal Medical Center. The idea of the planners, myself included, was that the power of euthanasia as an ultimate modality for alleviation of suffering was well recognized in veterinary medicine, but insufficiently so in human medicine. Do you know why suicide is against the law, ridiculously? Because you, I researched this for a medical textbook. Uh, because you don't own your life. God and the kingdom, according to the British common law. 
thinking of my uh, This was well illustrated by the conundrum that a person who fails to euthanize a suffering animal is society perceived as being morally blameworthy, while a person who helps a suffering grandmother begging to die <coughs> is also seen as blameworthy. It doesn't make sense, right? The organizer just felt that his companion animals become increasingly perceived as members of the family. The moral imperative that suffering might conceivably transfer to human medicine. With the wisdom of hindsight, it is now clear that the hopes of the organizers were bound to be dashed. The social willingness to euthanize uh, animals stem not so much from their assuming new and higher moral status in society as from the view of animals as replaceable. The proliferation of veterinary specialty practices and social willingness to spend vast amounts of money for animal treatment was not yet present in 1980 in a widespread way. And in human medicine, probably uh, most ominously, quality of life considerations were not yet dominant values. In fact, nobody talked about quality of life. I mean, I remember having a friend with cancer who would say, um, just in the first six months I had in my life, this chemo was worse than dying. And the doctor would say, what are you bitching about before you an extra six months? It was just strictly quantitative measure. The assimilation of medicine to science in the early 20th century followed the publication of the Selective Flexner Report. You know about the Flexner Report? Uh, Abraham Flexner worked with Rockefeller Institution and uh, found that actually statistically you were better off not going to hospital at that point because you were more likely to die in infection. Um, so medicine was not yet science-based, and there was this wide proliferation of modalities, maybe um, hydrogen therapy, taking less than the ice cold water, there's a lot of people with cancer, you know, and uh, all these other sorts of things. As medicine became applied biology or biomedical science, certain key aspects of traditional medicine were suppressed. For example, as rational treatments for diseases like cancer emerged, physicians marked their success by measurably empirical, indisputable parameters. As I said, additional life garnered by way of treatment. Such a scoring system, however, entails a study of neglect with quality of life consideration. While chemo or radiation did indeed prolong life in many instances, medicine failed to ask at what cost. Qualitative considerations such as patient subjective experience became literally invisible to scientific medicine in the face of the assumption that more life was always better and was a victory against the disease. That's how doctors used to talk. Social, cultural, idiosyncratic, and moral dimensions of the person, features essential to being the person, came to be seen as irrelevant to the task of medicine or as mystical or metaphysical, and therefore outside the physician purview. Physicians do often treat illnesses strictly as bodily malfunctions, and saw no need to be more than polite and competent applied scientists. A great deal, of course, has been written about the tendency of physicians to forget that patients are persons, and to designate patients by such locutions as the kidney in room 422, the osteosarcoma, the goma. Have you guys read The House of God? Do yourself a favor and read this book. I think it's still in print. It's called, uh, would you read it there? Is it hysterical or what? The House of God. It's about uh, Beth Israel at Harvard by a young intern. And it is black and funny, but very funny. What is interesting to medicine as a science are the repeatable universal features of bodies not the individuality of persons. Hospitals and hospital guards suppress even external manifestations of individual uniqueness. The same way that the uh, concentration camp uniforms make these people all the same and easier to kill. In the hospital, nobody knows that you're you know, CEO or GE or anything like that. You're just another guy trying to do that. Did, did, did it ever dawn on you, by the way, why they do those hospital gowns? 
so that you have to hold it closed. It was delivered. I had a surgeon come, chairman of the department. He said, it's done to reduce you to the status of an embarrassed patient. So you're not, you're not shepherd, you're a stock boy. a captain of industry, you're just another guy who's asked to show up. You know? <laughs> you gotta love it, right? <laughs> um, palliative care is the value in the field to preserve life. Two examples will make this clear. In 1972, psychiatrists Marx and Sapien were called into the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to consult on an alleged outbreak of, quote, insanity, characterized by patients engaging in extreme emotional behavior, banging their heads against the wall, pulling their hair, screaming, etc. The psychiatrists soon realized that the issue was not madness, but rather patient response to extreme and untreated cancer pain. Can you imagine that? And oncologists too dumb to realize that people were hurting. And too arrogant to ask them. As recently as 1991, it was reported that 90% of cancer pain was treatable with an alternate modality. 80% of cancer pain was not controlled. Not controlled at all. In the same vein, hospice was a concept developed and was totally by nurses not scientific physician, physicians to help preserve patient quality of life. Very rarely do you find a physician involved in hospice. As one nursing dean stated, physicians worry about cure, nurses worry about care. If pain is ignored as scientifically unreal, what hope is there for other negatives to follow the treatment, such as loss of vigor? If they're not willing to count for this physical pain, how much you think is going to get across to my college when I worry about my dignity? You know, I raised my kid right. I told him when we had visited the nursing home. I said, Mike, if I get like that, I want you to strike me to the Harley and run me off a cliff. And with the sensitivity that I'm so proud of, he said, what a waste of a good bike. <laughs> 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 In a major ironic twist of fate, fate, rather than human medicine learning the wisdom of euthanasia of suffering animals from veterinary medicine, in the ensuing 30 years, when in fact happened with veterinary medicine assimilated some of the most pernicious aspects of human medicine. In particular, as animals became increasingly viewed as members of the family, the reluctance to euthanize began to enter veterinary medicine which many of you are experiencing today. A variety of surveys have been conducted on the percentage of pet owners who view their animals as members of the family. I did a literature search on this. The lowest number attributed such a view to 88% of the pet owning population. The highest describes it to 98%. I mean, we can quibble about the accuracy of such polls, but it is indubitable that so viewing one's companion animals as a dominant mode of society thought. Every veterinary school, every major clinic has provisions for grief counseling for owners who've lost an animal. More and more people will respond to the question, do you have children, by saying, no, we have dogs. Right? I remember when I was, I spent a year in the veterinary hospital before I even dared teach veterinary ethics, you know, chatting with various clinicians. And one, one woman was pretty rare in those days. She told me, watch this. Um, this. This woman has had her, her bitch and little puppies in the hospital for a few days, and we had to euthanize them all. I forget why. And he's now going to tell this to the owner. And as he told the owner, she fell forward into his arms. He backpedaled. Just like a cornerback, you know, running in that cornerback kind of run. And finally, she kept falling into his arms. He hit the wall, and she grabbed him. But he was enormously uncomfortable. And uh, this, this lady who I was shadowing said, try and do something about that. We're not serving our patients, our clients, patients well. 
and we did the time with uh, Steve Withrow had signed on to CSU as the director of the cancer center. He was very concerned about that. He hired people uh, who, who made the students more sensitive to it. Companion animals in today's world provide us with love and someone to love and do so unfailingly with loyalty, grace, and devotion. How many of you read John Cass's book entitled The New Work of Dogs? The New Work of Dogs by Pat? Nobody? It's really, a, I'm not picking for, for cats, but it's a book that every better, certainly any smaller veterinarian should read. Uh, it's all based on his personal experiences with dogs in the New York uh, suburban community in Jersey. We read, for example, the dog who a woman credits with shepherding her through a losing battle with cancer. It's her emotional bedrock. Um, Katz tells of the Divorced Women's Dog Club, a group of divorced women uh, in their 50s. You know, when the guy begins to hear the reaper, gets the comb over, dumps the wife, buys the um, gold pen and the corvette, you know? So these women grew into the Divorced Women's Dog Club. Um, United only by these women, united only by their divorce and the reliance on their dogs. Um, he tells the tale of a dog who provides an outlet for uh, the ghetto kids, the very small ghetto kids, big Rottweiler, insecurity and rage, and who is beaten daily by the kid, given a sense of powerfulness. He relates the story of a successful executive with a family and friends, who in the end deals with stress in his life only by getting up at 4 in the morning and taking long walks with his laboratory. Cat says, are we entitled to respect the Savannah? He says, no. But they perform their own. And you all know cases like that. You can write your own list. Our pets have become sources of friendship in the old and lonely vehicles for penetrating the frightful shell surrounding the disturbed child. Beings that provide the comfort and touch even to the most asocial people and frankly inexhaustible sources of pure and qualified love. How many of you have seen the video of the nursing home with the old man in the rocking chair? No? It's amazing. It's a real film. It's not a real actor. This guy, probably about 85, he'd been in this rocking chair for 20 years. And I guess somebody had the idea of giving him a puppy. And he had this frozen face. Yeah, have you ever seen that? You know, just kind of a rictus. They gave him the puppy and he smiled. And he said, pretty. World War II, what they now call PTSD, what they used to call the shell shock. Uh, was very tr treated very successfully by a guy named Boris Levinson, a psychiatrist, just by giving these people dogs. You know? Kind of pissed me off when the Department of Defense recently announced that they were going to only take certain special, remember? PTSD dogs because they had to be trained by the right. Doesn't have to be trained, you know? That's what's so damn stupid. What's the training for PTSD dogs, you know? Commiserate? <laughs> relationships with animals as a regular and increasingly accepted social phenomenon came from a variety of converging and mutually reinforcing social conditions. In the first place, probably beginning with the widespread use of the automobile, extended nuclear families with multi generations living in one location or under one roof began to vanish. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, when roughly half the public produced food for themselves and the other half, Significant numbers of large extended families lived together men in farms. The safety net for old people was their family, rather than society as a whole. I shudder to think of that in the case today. Um, the rest of the good life. The concept of easy mobility made preserving the nuclear family less of necessity, as did the rise of the new idea that the 
society as a whole, rather than the family is responsible for assuring the retirement, medical attention, and facilities for elderly people. With the concentration of agriculture in fewer and fewer hands, the rise of industrialization in all areas, and as the post-depression dust bowl in World War II introduced migration to cities, the nuclear family notion is further eroded. The tendency of urban life to erode uh, community, to create what the Germans call a Gesellschaft mixture. I'm sorry. Yeah, mixture, rather than Gemeinschaft compound organic unities. Um, I lived in New York for 26 years, and I lived in Colorado for 40 years of life. And uh, I, I never saw a human mind shop in New York City. It's just a big bag of marbles all rubbing against each other. Whereas you get into these little ranch towns in Wyoming, everybody watches out for everybody. Right, Ken? Um, but anyway, more and more people moving to the city created solitude and loneliness as widespread modes of being. And as selfishness and self-actualization were established as positive values beginning in highly individualistic 60s, the divorce rate began to climb, and the traditional stigma attached to divorce was the worst. You know what percentage of married people get divorced from? 60. I remember one of my veterinarian friends telling me his wife was leaving her when they get divorced. She's being trained as a psychotherapist. And uh, her, her mentor told her she was codependent. I said, that's good, right? I mean, if you and your husband are codependent, that's what you should do. No, apparently it's not good. I don't know why, you know. As they say, it sounds like bullshit to me, but, you know. Um, as biomedicine, prolonged our lifespan as more and more people significantly outlived their spouses in the throne of the loneliness mode of existence with the loss of extended family and removing the revenue. So what do we got? We got lonely old people, lonely divorced people, and lonely kids. The single parent usually works, you know, and so the kids on their own. With the best jobs being urban or quasi-urban, many people live in cities or peripherally urban development, such as condos. And there's no question in my mind that in New York City you can be lonelier than in rural Wyoming. The cowboy craving camaraderie to find a neighbor from whom he is separated only by physical distance. 80 miles from my ranch friend lives from his nearest neighbor. The urban person may know no one and have no one with striking distance that cares. Short of physical space, people create psychic distance between themselves and others. People may, and usually do for years, live six inches away from neighbors in apartment buildings and never exchange a sentence. Watch New Yorkers on an elevator. It's hysterically funny now that I call your attention to it. The rule is stand as far away uh, on an elevator from the others as you can and study the ceiling. Have you seen that? Um, making eye contact on the street can be taken as a challenge or a sexual invitation, so people do not. When I first, this is not a joke. I call my wife right now and she'll let us in. When I got to Fort Collins, I thought that the entire female population was hookers. <laughs> because they'd smile at me on the street and say, good morning. <laughs> Nobody in New York ever, ever does that unless they're over. <laughs> One minds one's own business, one steps over and around drunks on the street. Don't get involved is a mantra for survival. But humans need love, companionship, friendship, emotional support, and need to be needed. Um, in such a world, a companion animal can be one psychic and spiritual salvation. An animal for somebody to hug, to hug you back, someone to play with, to laugh with. You walk, you share, nice days, art and stuff. For a, for a child, the dog is a protector, a with you, someone to talk to. There's a great, have you guys read Kohler's book on dog training, Kohler method? It's a generation old, but there's a great photo in there, which was a real photo, thanks to some family. It shows an urban kid answering the door. Suffering. 
because there were no police locks on the door. You know about police locks? That's a New York phenomenon. It's an iron bar that slips into an iron cup on the floor and then buttresses the door. Which absolutely does not stop the bad guys. My neighbor had two police slots and they cut the door out with a chainsaw. <laughs> he was just standing and staring at the police box, still stuck in the floor. Um, but in this photo, the kid's got what has to be a 250 pound, probably dead by the cop, opening the door. Otherwise, they would never dare let the kid open the door. Because it was a female that he was not protected. Because they answered. Dr. Whitney put it the violence in those doors. Right? You guys know why that's the case? Because when they first showed Great Danes in the North of the 19th century in the United States, the dog promptly ate the judge. And so they were banished. They're actually vicious dogs. They were banished until such time, it said, that a child could lead them into the ring. So we pussy them. You know? Those of you who are small animal veterinarians have occasionally met a throwback male. Am I right? <laughs> um, for many old people, the dog or a cat is a reason to get up in the morning, to go out, to bundle up, and go to the park. I lived off of the side drive, which is very, very cold. Chicago, the cold wind went up the river. And I remember going down one day in my apartment and seeing this 85, 88 year old lady getting all bundled up and getting ready to walk towards the park. And I said, This is so and so. I mean, it's horrible out there. You could catch a terrible cold and all that. She said, Fluffy misses her friends. As if that ended the discussion, you know? <laughs> and in a sense, it did, you know? Um, it gave her a reason to fuss, to feel responsible, to feel needed. Thus, companion animals in today's world provide us with all these gifts. But a dog is more than that. I'm the first one to write about this. In New York and in other big, cold, tough cities, it's a social lubricant. Are you from New York, is it? Well, in New York, if you've got a brain, or, or unless you have a death wish, you don't talk to strangers. The exception to that is if one or both of you are walking a dog, right? And then the barrier is crumbling. Could be a child, too. That's a pretty extreme move. One of the most extraordinary phenomena I've ever participated in was the so-called dog people in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. These were people who walked their dogs at roughly the same time, early morning, evening, in Riverside Park, united by a common legitimate purpose having dogs in common, and therefore being above suspicion, conversation would start spontaneously. We didn't know each other's names. We were Red's owner, eldest person, Fucky's mistress, but names didn't matter. And this is an amazing story. Uh, Phil was an ex-British commando who had been in the raid with kayaks on um, the French port, and they sunk some German ships and all that. Uh, the Cock and Shell Hero, was a movie made about that. And Phil had this big, giant, great day. I'm, I'm sorry, the shepherd, probably 150 pound shepherd named Red, who was a pussycat of people, but terrible with other male dogs, in fact, And uh, Phil announced one day that he, um, he had had earnings surgery for a couple of weeks. And so we said, what about Red? He said, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. We all volunteered. 24-7, people took care of Red for two weeks, you know? It was pretty amazing, considering Phil didn't know our name, you know? We didn't know his last name, but we passed the key around, and nobody took advantage. Of course, the animals didn't know New York etiquette and played with one another, so that broke the ice. Whether it's a cause or effect or both of the rise in the status of companion animals, the last 40 years have witnessed an enormous and prolific explosion in the number of specialty veterinary practices treating companion animals. Veterinary hospitals, as you know well, deploy 
many of the most sophisticated diagnostic and treatment modalities found in human medicine to treat found in animals. These include radiation, treatment, transplant surgery, open heart surgeries, CAT scans, MRI diagnoses, particle accelerators, stem cells, immunotherapy, dialysis, and a vast panoply of other expensive approaches to animal disease. The financial barriers to widespread use of such treatments seem to be crumbling, or at least is seen as irrelevant to much of the dependent animal owning population. Fair enough. Um, I have to tell you this in the interest of full disclosure. I spent twelve thousand dollars on my pit bull on TPLO. What do I need to do? I got it. He's my buddy. You know, I would want to euthanize me if I I do have a bad name, so. Um, first one failed. And so we really had three. And there was a lot of agony that we got. You know? Um, as laudable as the societal change regarding companion animals may be, it creates a new source of moral stress for veterinarians. Whereas we saw veterinarians were faced with stresses growing out of climate demand for convenience with the manager, um, the issue remains, of course, for certain bad clients and is compounded by an opposite source of stress. Clients being unwilling to use in our separate animals and instead holding on to continuing treatment, regardless of the cost financially or worse, the cost of the quality of animal life. How many experiences? Majority. Thus, it is quite possible that a veterinarian may find himself or herself advocating for the animal in the face of client demand for convenience euthanasia, as if that's not emotionally jarring enough, and then later that day advocating that and suffering a different chronically ill animal by euthanasia with a client unwilling to give up on treatment. And thereafter, some of you may experience this, it's, it's right in California. Well, why should I give up, Doc? I read about these um, colored lights therapy that cures cancer. Have any of you encountered this? I read about it on a lot of, well, that's highly incredible. Um, Counterintuitively, the augmented moral stress of the companion animal compound of other areas job created moral stress. Given that the legal status of animals decreased that they have the property of owners, whether the situation be that the client demands euthanasia in morally unjustifiable circumstances or refuses to terminate the suffering of the sick animal, the veterinarian is in a highly untenable position of knowing the right thing to do, yet being unable to implement his or her expertise. Adding to this problem is the fact that trying everything is what veterinary specialists do, and probably the specialist doesn't have the kind of relationship with the clients to say, Straightforwardly, it's time to let go. I had uh, years of feud with Withrow uh, because Withrow said if you as a veterinarian are asked, what would you do if it was your dog or not? Withrow taught the kids who sidestep that. And I always said, no, God damn it, it's part of your moral and professional responsibility to answer it as best you can. You know? He said, well, then, then they blame you for killing the dog. Well, you can look at that, you know? Um, a good general practitioner staying involved even after referral can help serve as a check against well-intentioned but excessive zeal by the specialist. Furthermore, we live in a society in which medical paternalism is a dirty word, and patient or client autonomy is a trendy slogan. My wife, who's the smartest person I know, she has a measured IQ of 175. She says, I like the term. I like to assume that the guy knows what he's talking about with regard to the dog or with regard to me. I don't want autonomy. You know, all this crap that started in the 70s. A woman's body, you know, and the man's you know, body. I want the doctor who authoritatively tells me to do this, do that. That's what she says. My own reason for not wanting it is I don't trust anyone. My son really wanted it, and he said, don't trust anyone. Uh, nonetheless, a powerful element of paternalism is alive and thriving, and can, in fact, 
going to put effect on veterinarians. I am referring here to a veterinarian since you lack an authority. Are you guys familiar with that concept? The senior authority possessed by physicians in, or, or veterinarians in virtue of being medical professionals. It is Esculapian authority that allowed Hitler's physician to scold him for his diet. Adolf is getting pudgy, consuming too many cream cakes. Anybody else would have been shot for that. Doctor could get away with it. I had an MD tell me once, he said, I get people with migraine headaches. I could tell them with a straight face, go to the top of the Sears Tower and stick your naked butt out the window in a windstorm, and they'll do it. That's as we might be an authority, you know? To deploy such authority on behalf of the animal to end suffering is, in my view, not only permissible, but obligatory. When clients ask, what would you do if you were your dog, they don't feel that you are as we might be an authority. And I think you should respond to the in a strictly wound up with successful deployment of that authority um, is the issue of explaining to clients, and this is really going to be new to most of you, some fundamental differences between human and animal mental life that have major and radically distinct implications for quality of life in people versus animals. Human thought is irreducibly tied to language, which allows us aggression into modes of thoughts to animals. Humans can think in very abstract terms, for example, mathematics and logic. In negative terms, there are no dragons in the library. In conditional terms, if it does rain, we will hold graduation indoors. In futural terms, I want to retire in Iceland someday. In universal terms, all triangles have three sides. In fictional terms, writing novels. In counterfactual terms, if Darwin had not discovered natural selection, someone else would have. These are all made possible by being able to structure thought linguistically, which in turn allows linguistic syntax to transcend thought rooted in immediate experience. Does this make sense so far to you guys? As one who did much to restore the credibility of talking about animal pain and distress and emotion, I certainly do not deny the richness and moral relevance of animal mental life. There is, however, a striking dissimilarity between humans and animals facing life threatening illness, even as ironically the tools of, of the two fields given in such crises converge in such areas. Human cognition is such that it can value long term future goals and endure short term negative experiences for the sake of achieving them. Many examples. Many of us undergo voluntary food restriction and the unpleasant experience attended in its way for the sake of lowering blood pressure or for the good of the king for some of the stuff, right? We memorize volumes of boring material and then we forget for the sake of gaining an admission or graduation from medical school or veterinary school. We endure the excruciating pain of cosmetic surgery in order to look better. Jan, do you know the number one male cosmetic surgery in the United States? I didn't think you would. Uh, I heard this from a uh, LA doctor. Hector Rubens. Second is calf What I always tell my audience is, you want pectorals? Earn them. 43 years of bench pressing up to 500 pounds. That's where I got my I'm not going to make some damn plastic surgery for you. <laughs> and we certainly endure chemotherapy, radiation, dialysis, physical therapy, and transplants to achieve longer life with a better quality of life than we would without it. Or in some cases, we need to look for longer life of life to see our children graduate or finish their book or fulfill some other goal. In the case of animals, and I want to stress this, there is absolutely no evidence, either factual or conceptual, that they have the capability of weighing future benefits against current misery, or future possibilities against current misery. To entertain the belief that my current pain and distress resulting from the nausea of chemotherapy or some highly invasive surgery will be offset by the possibility of an indefinite amount of future time, end quote, is taken to be axiomatic of human thinking. 
But reflection reveals that such thinking requires complex cognitive machinery. For example, one needs both temporal and abstract concepts, such as possible future concepts, and the ability to compare them. A concept of death, eloquently defined by Heidegger, has grasped the quote, the possibility of the impossibility of your being. Think of that one. The ability to articulate possible suffering and so on. This in turn requires the ability to think in an if then hypothetical and counterfactual mode. If I do not do this, then this will occur, that will occur. This mode of thinking seems to be impossible without symbols and syntax to combine them. Right. I give you a billion dollars and you explain to your dog that there are no ducks in the library. You can take them through and you would see and you might think, well, there's actually nothing in the library for books. But try to express there are no ducks, there are no pheasants, there are no rabbits, you can't do it, no matter what. You know? You can't even tell a rabbit with an exo. You know? To treat our companion animals morally with respect, we need to keep in mind that meditation limits. Paramount is in importance is the extreme unlikelihood that they can understand the concept of life and death in themselves rather than the pains and pleasures associated with life or death. To the animal mind, in the real sense, there is only quality of life. Only quality of life. I.e., whether its experiential content is pleasant or unpleasant in all the modes it's capable of. Bored or occupied, fearful or not fearful, lonely or enjoying companionship, painful or not, hungry or not, thirsty or not. We have absolutely no reason to believe that an animal can grasp the notion of extended life, let alone choose to trade current suffering for it. Would you guys buy that? Because that's a critical point to this whole argument. This in turn entails that we realistically assess as far as possible what the animals are experiencing. An animal cannot weigh being treated for cancer against the suffering it entails. An animal cannot affirm or even conceive of his desire to endure current suffering for the sake of future life. It cannot choose to lose a leg to preclude metastasis. We must remember that an animal, and this, they used to say that uh, human pain is, is worse than animal because, um, what? Because, oh yeah, because your pain, like going to the dentist, is exacerbated by worrying that the dentist is just a mango, you remember? The marathon man. And that, you know, maybe he had a fight with his wife and he's been taken out on the blood. Um, an animal is its pain. An animal is its pain. It is incapable of anticipating or even hoping the sensation of that pain. Right? Thus, when we're confronted with life threatening illnesses that afflict our animals, it is not axiomatic that they be treated at whatever qualitative experiential cost that may entail. The owner may consider the suffering and treatment with modality entails a small price for extra life, but the animal neither values nor comprehends extra life, let alone the trade-offs. Treatment for minor illnesses or injuries can be justified by the virtual certainty that the owner has of the long pleasant life thereafter. The owner, in turn, may ignore the difference between human and animal mind and choose the possibility of life and prolongation at any qualitative cost. It is at this point that the morally responsible veterinarian is thrust into his or her role as animal advocate, speaking for what matters to the animal. I'm not, of course, denying that animals can have short-term future expectations and projections. This is evidenced by the cat waiting outside the mouse hole, or the dog waiting at the door for a walk. These limited future anticipations can be explained by associated learning. Every time I go to my great name, who is not an Einstein among dogs, nonetheless learned early that if she goes to the door, we let her out. Later, she turned that into a kind of symbolic thing. She got to the door, and then we go to let her out, and she would bark at us. So my wife would say, Well, what do you want? Boom. She'd say, Well, you don't want to go out. Boom. Okay. You want a milk bone? <laughs> so she
she's using symbols. You know? Not understanding that we don't know the end. You know? Um, what, is, what I am denying is that animals can conceptualize accepting the current nature of suffering for the possibility of extended life. We have no reason to believe that an animal can grasp the notion of extended life, let alone choose to train the current suffering. Quality of life consideration should be introduced at the beginning of the veterinarian client relationship, not suddenly sprung on the client when the treatment is over and the uh, owner is desperate. In particular, it is useful to recall Plato's dictum that when dealing with ethics in adults, it's better to remind than to teach. For this reason, the client, who after all knows the animal better than you do, should be encouraged from the beginning to help define quality of life for that animal. From the outset, I would rec recommend that the veterinarian obtain from the clients a list as long as possible of what makes the animal happy or unhappy and how they know it. And people will understand that question. They won't see it as a philosophical question. This list, written down as part of the medical record, can serve to remind the owners of their own criteria for quality of life at the point where treatment has failed. Maybe you've written it down 10 years earlier. When wishful thinking and essentially selfish desires may replace objectivity. I use this method with a friend of mine, in fact, he was the president of our university who asked me how to judge when it was time for euthanasia and how to avoid compromising his animal's quality of life by overly prolonging treatment. He later thanked me and told me that were it not for his own encoded notes to find the animal's quality of life, while it was still well, which he'd long forgotten, he would have rationalized trying a variety of alternative modalities that would have greatly impaired the animal's quality of life. Unquestionably, he said, denial would have distorted his perception, but for his own reflexive, reflective, codified deliberations on the animal's quality of life, which even an extremist was impossible to ignore. In the end, such dialogue, while awkward, difficult, and emotional, could nevertheless benefit the animal, the owner, and the other members of the peace of mind. An additional ethical issue really pisses me off. Regarding end of life for companion animals has been created by the advent of phosphorus. You guys familiar with that? Southern California creation. Hospice for dying animals. In some ways, this is a good thing if it's run right. Many owners do not have the time or the ability to provide the regular treatments intended to a chronically ill or terminally ill animal payers. And that can be a very valuable service that uh, some good hospices provide. However, given that the hospice profits for as long as the animal requires hospice care, they may well arise a pernicious tendency on the part of those running hospice to keep the animal alive as long as possible, thereby failing to reckon quality of life issues. I have heard anecdotally of some hospice veterinarians catering to own reluctance to euthanize uh, by their willingness to pursue all sorts of unproven and untested evidentially baseless alternative modalities to save the animal's life. One clinic I know goes as far as going to Mexico to acquire such defunct cancer drugs as Lathan and, and telling the owner, well, many people think it works, uh, pretend that the owner falls hopes and then might prolong the revenue stream. I don't like this people, I've said this to you know? There's a new thing in California. Figure if it's in California in six years in the Midwest. This is, this is client, shut up. This is clients that go to a shelter and adopt terminally ill animals. Have you guys heard of this? Oh, this is so sick. So they can hold the animal when the life leaves it. That's a sacred moment when the animal dies. So they adopt the animal out the land so they can hold it. This is the other sick. Um, this is not only a hospice issue, though. It may well arise in all practices when clients are unwilling to give up and the veterinarian is reluctant to fight the euthanasia. 
Let us recall, when I did a book on this with Dave Raymond, the equine veterinarian, and you guys know Raymond? He's the curmudgeon that's always writing tactical alternative medicine. So he called me up and said, you taught me to think, you taught me to reason, now I'm attacked for it. So I said, good, let's do a book. So we did a book called Complementary Alternative Medicine Considered. And I know all those charlatans of sticky pins in my effigy. So far it hasn't hurt me. Um, let us recall that in a deep sense, there is no alternative medicine. Got it? This I stole from a, a piece of the New England Journal. Uh, there is medicine that has sound scientific evidence and, evidence, and medicine that has none. And a wide variety of modalities have no evidence. Or indeed, for example, homeopathy, you know about homeopathy? If that's true, modern chemistry is false. And I'm not ready to sacrifice modern chemistry in order to extol if the question, what harm can an ineffective alternative do, I would answer in a very straightforward fashion. It could cater to honor wishful thinking while prolonging unnecessarily the animal's suffering. The longer one pursues useless remedies, the longer the animal experiences negative quality of life, and the longer the veterinarian suffers moral stress. Last paragraph. I think I assume you're here to pull me off the stage. Good luck. Bigger people than you are in sum, euthanasia is a double-edged sword in veterinary medicine. It is a powerful and ultimately the most powerful tool for ending the pain and suffering that may well be an animal's entire life. The demand for its use for client convenience is morally reprehensible and creates major moral stress for ethically conscious practitioners and goes against the very essence of the veterinarian's goal to alleviate pain and maximize animal health and quality of life. But equally reprehensible and stressful to veterinarians is the failure to use it when an animal faces only misery, pain, stress, and suffering. Finding the correct path through this minefield may well be the most important asset ethical task. Basically, I can't change this for another day. Thanks for listening. Second thing would be to uh, get the veterinary profession to 
explain these distinctions to about that kind of mission to clients. Look, let's face it, the average vet doesn't get it. I had a guy arguing with me last week, the last hour of the day, I gave the Charles River lecture at Payless, arguing that uh, animals have language. I said, really? Yeah, they can, they can communicate. Well, every mode of communication is not language. Human beings that get strokes in the linguistic part of the uh, brain, where the, the linguistic ability is ablated, can nonetheless learn to communicate, but without syntax. It's a backup system, like right? that's why we have two eyes and this kind of thing, you know. Um, the backup system, you can't say it on an abstract stuff, but you can say, I'm hungry, or I'm thirsty, or Let's sit down. Where do you? Just think so. All right. You stop telling your workers to tell people like that lady, sure, we'll do our best. In fact, tell her she wants the animal adopted to somebody else. Let her come back every day and then watch the euthanasia at the end of the week. Because no bloody human being is going to adopt a 16 year old blind Labrador that supposedly she's bonded Now, your administrators will never accept that. Because then you can't get money, you know? But that's bullshit. I mean, your own mental health is worth more than contributions, I think. So if you're asking me what I would recommend, that's what I would recommend. Does that make sense to you? Okay, well then maybe uh, you don't need the money as much. Well, well then your administrators who are so PC, PC pussies, you know? They don't want to make anybody angry. Well, shit, I walk into a room and make people angry. <laughs> the most common comment I get, I'm trying to teach you something important. I don't like you. Well, I said, well, my stock answer is this. My wife likes me 40% of the time. My son likes me 90% of the time. My two dogs like me 100% of the time. That's all I need. And if you don't like We've got two choices. You can go to the end of the line, which is about two miles over. And, and I can prove that I've said this. Or I can jump into the front of the line and I'll take you take outside, take the shit out of you for being a rude bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to do Who wants to do what you like? Tell the truth. You want a couple of people to like you, right? And that's enough. I don't think there's a power of them. People like me. <laughs> that makes sense? Did I answer you? Thanks. Thank you for guys for having me. It was really the best question. The best advice I've ever done.